Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Well, me, my daughter-in-law Emma, and my granddaughter Charlotte had a girls' night on Friday while Grandpa Jim and Ben went to the Twins game. So we uh, all walked outside to the car. It was a beautiful evening Friday night. And um, then I watched Ben and Emma as they tried to explain to their two-year-old, Dad and Grandpa were leaving, and, but they would be coming back. And, um, and Charlotte got so worried and anxious, she'd look to Ben and cry, Daddy! And she'd look to Emma and cry, Mommy! And her head kept swiveling back and forth, Daddy, Mommy! <laughs> Trying to understand. And that moment, confused and anxious moment of who was staying behind and who was leaving and who's going to come back is kind of the movements of Easter story. Instinctively, I picked up Charlotte and I held her and she sensed that everything was going to be all right, even if she couldn't understand it all just then. Her parents had given her their word and promise and I held on to her when she was anxious. And you know, a lot of our life is lived like this, isn't it? And our faith. I thought of holding on to Charlotte, but that's like our trust. Those are times when we're anxious, but we trust. We trust by holding on to God, and we trust that God is holding us, always. Well, today's gospel earned one of Jesus' disciples a nickname, Doubting Thomas. Thomas needed more than the disciples' word when they told him, we have seen the Lord. He wanted to touch and see Jesus in person. And I think Thomas gets a bad rap, if I could make a case. And I'd encourage you to open up a sanctuary Bible to the Gospel of John. And we're going to start at chapter 11. So we can see who Thomas is. Thomas is named among the 12 disciples of Jesus. He's called the twin. And chapter 11 is um, the chapter of the story of the raising of Lazarus. These are friends of Jesus, Mary and Martha and Lazarus and Bethany. Jesus spent a lot of time with them. Lazarus falls ill and he dies. And Jesus gets word of this. And he says to his disciples, it's time to go to Jerusalem. And they know that's trouble. Bethany was right near Jerusalem, I should explain. Um, I don't exactly know what Thomas's tone of voice was, but I know that he didn't try to tell his Lord and Master what to do, because remember Peter tried that once and it didn't work out very good. The whole get behind me Satan thing. So Thomas resigned to what his Lord and Master wants to do, to walk into danger, says, let us also go that we may die with him. Well, that sounds like pretty heavy commitment and faith right there, that he is willing to go with Jesus into trouble. Next, we hear from Thomas as Jesus is explaining to his disciples they're in Jerusalem. They've had their last meal together. Jesus washed their feet. And Jesus is trying to tell them that he has to go somewhere where they can't follow him, but he's going to come back. To get them and so that where he is they may also be this is John chapter 14 do not let your hearts be troubled believe in God believe also in me in my father's house there are many dwelling places and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am you may also be and you know the way to the place I am going and here's Thomas again Lord we do not know where you're going how can we know the way See, Thomas, I think, is just the kind of person that says what everybody else is thinking. He's just a kind of a concrete, direct thinker, and that's how he believes, too. And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Then we go to chapter 20. This is John's Easter Gospel. So when Mary Magdalene came first to the tomb, she did not see the empty tomb or the linens 
that had, had covered Jesus' body, that had wrapped his body, the linens laying there, or even the two angels, she didn't exclaim, he is risen. Instead, she said, someone has stolen the body of our Lord. The evidence of all of that didn't dawn on her. It's only when she turned and bumped right into Jesus, and still, it's not that she sees him, but he speaks her name, and she hears his voice. A familiar voice and she recognizes Jesus Jesus tells her to tell the disciples and so she runs and tells them I have seen the Lord and do the disciples in the upper room believe no they remain locked in fear in the upper room despite this news of the resurrection again it's when Jesus comes to greet them gives them peace that they are ready to tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord. So you see, Thomas really is only asking for what all the rest of the disciples wanted and got, visual confirmation. Like I say, he's a concrete thinker, and most of us are. He wanted to see the crucified Christ was the risen Christ. He wanted to see the wounds. And if that, people of God, is what you need today, then come to Holy Communion. Come to Holy Communion. Um, at our first service, we celebrated um, our youth and families receiving First Communion. And what I say to them, I say to you, look, here is Christ. Here are his wounds, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here, Christ is with us, so that we may believe. When we receive the body and blood of our Lord, we are looking at his wounds, his broken body, his blood shed on the cross. Every week you'll see the risen Christ in the Eucharist. You'll see his passion for you, his love and sacrifice for you, his death and resurrection for you. And he is nourishing you with his very life. Now there's a consequence to missing out. Thomas wasn't there to see the risen Lord the first Easter. And when we don't come to communion, and when we skip church, we miss out. We miss out on a marvelous meal, a meal meant to feed us the life of Christ. And when we don't receive that, we start to become, well, if you don't drink water, you become dehydrated. If you don't eat, you become famished. And you begin to reach for the wrong things to try to satisfy that deep hunger and thirst. Just like when you're hungry and in a hurry, you'll reach for junk food and diet soda pop. Things that won't give you the life of Christ. You think you're doing okay, but you're actually starving your soul and you're putting other things into your life and your heart. For a while you think you're okay and then you become sick. I mean spiritually sick. And one, your life moves in a direction one step after another further away from God, from life, from Christ. And when someone meets you, Easter doesn't look like it's very important in your life. Our doubting Thomas touches Jesus' wounds, and then he exclaims one of the most powerful confessions in the New Testament, my Lord and my God. And so I'm going to invite each one of you today, as you come up and receive communion, to say that very thing. Now, I know when you come to communion, like we taught our First Communion uh, youth to, to say something when they receive Christ, they receive the elements of communion, to say, thank you, Lord, or, you know, Nan Anderson always says, praise the Lord, when she comes up for communion. But today, I want you to say Thomas's confession, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, blessed are those um, Jesus said to Thomas, do you believe because you have seen me? But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. We believe through faith. 
We believe through trust. We believe by holding on to God and knowing that God is holding on to us. And so we must never think small of this. We must never think small of ourselves. We must never think small of our church, our ability um, to receive Christ and be changed, because God has made us bearers of the greatest news, the greatest love, the greatest truth in all time. Jesus breathed on his disciples, and he breathes on us, his Holy Spirit, to share this good news. He breathes into us gifts, gifts to share the news. Today, Natasha Campbell, talk about inspired, made the most beautiful cakes for First Communion. I hope we took pictures of them. Emily Renier, doesn't she sing so beautifully? And she's grown up in this church. Gifts to share. Gifts to tell the gospel. Gifts to share Easter's joy. And all of this should be an encouragement to us and a sign of hope for us. Despite the suffering in the world, the violence in the world, the divisiveness, the fears among people, and our own personal struggles, God has not abandoned us. God is with us. We are not left alone. The risen Savior is here. So, what are we to do with those 50 days of Easter? It's 50 days to look for the presence of Christ. It's 50 days to celebrate the resurrection. And so I've got um, some questions for you. I left them on the um, left them on the welcome table. And I want you to take them throughout, use them throughout these 50 days. Find a friend to share them with. Um, share them as a family, share them with kids. You can all do this as a family together. Here are the questions as we use fully the 50 days of Easter. How will I know the risen Christ in my life today? How will I celebrate the risen Christ and Easter's victory today? How will I share the good news of Easter today? And how will I use the gifts of the Holy Spirit today? Marvelous questions, four questions for Easter. So that we don't just let Easter go by. <laughs> Remember, our gospel tells us Thomas missed the first Easter service. But Jesus came to him, and he does come to us. Every week, will you? Let's pray. No more we doubt thee, risen, conquering Son. All glory and honor to you, Lord Jesus. We will not let Easter just go by this year. But we ask that you breathe into us your living spirit and that you work in us through doubt and belief to make us stronger in faith. And you free us to leave behind the sad or dreary places that have held us in fear. Lord, lead us into Easter's light with your word, your promise, your peace, and your joy to proclaim. Alleluia. Amen.